Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. All right, guys, we are so close to announcing the details for CanMed 23. Our entire team has been working hard behind the scenes to create something truly special, but we can't tell you what it is just yet. More information will be available in the next few weeks. We can't wait to share this with you, and we hope that you're excited as well. But there are a few things that you can do to make sure you don't miss out on any news about CanMed 23. First, make sure you sign up for email alerts at canmedevents.com. There's a spot in the footer at the bottom of the page where you can enter your email address. Second, follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. Third, subscribe to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast. I will post a special announcement episode that includes all the details about CanMed 23. And if you are subscribed, that episode will show up in your podcast app. How convenient is that? In the meantime, you can enjoy videos of all the previous CanMed presentations and panel discussions, including the ones from CanMed 2022, in the CanMed archive at canmedevents.com. On this episode, I spoke with Ginny Curry. Ginny is the laboratory director at Modern Canna Laboratories Lakeland, Florida facility, where she focuses on developing standardized methods for analyzing cannabis to ensure harmful toxins are not present. Before entering the cannabis industry, Ginny gained valuable research experience at several well-respected institutes, including Emory University, the National Institute of Aging, and the University of Florida. Ginny recently received her Master's in Medical Cannabis Science and Therapeutics from the University of Maryland. In addition to running laboratory operations for Modern Canna, Ginny is also active in other areas of the cannabis industry. She currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board for Analytical Cannabis and is a member of the CASP Proficiency Testing Task Force with AOAC International. Ginny and her team recently performed a study that compared various methods of total yeast and mold testing. Their results showed that there is very little agreement between the methods, calling into question whether total yeast and mold is even a useful test. In the episode, we discuss why states require total yeast and mold testing, the different types of testing methods and how widely the results vary, how labs may not be giving yeast and mold enough time to grow, whether the variance in total yeast and mold testing results leads to lab shopping, and should total yeast and mold even be a required test? Before we get to my conversation with Ginny, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, Modern Canna Laboratories. Modern Canna is regarded as Florida's first medical cannabis laboratory and one of the most trusted third-party testing providers in the United States. The company's mission is to help set the standard for cannabis testing labs worldwide by providing the most accurate and efficient testing services delivered with a sense of compassion, integrity, and moral obligation, and to attract and attain clients who value quality data that is verifiable, reproducible, and legally defensible. Modern Canna is also the only Leafly certified laboratory in the Eastern United States and adheres to the industry's strictest SOPs and quality control standards. Modern Canna offers a wide variety of testing, rapid turnaround times, and consulting services to Florida medical marijuana treatment centers and hemp businesses throughout the U.S. For more information, visit moderncanna.com. Okay, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jenny Curry. Good morning, Jenny. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hi, yes. All right. So I read your article in Analytical Cannabis about the benefits and pitfalls of total yeast in mold counts in cannabis labs. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the show description so people can check that out. Um, and first, I want to thank you for writing it because 
our team at Medicinal Genomics, we've been talking about issues with total yeast and mold for years now. And, you know, we've published papers on it. We've done webinars about it. We've done canned med talks about it. Um, but since we're a kit manufacturer, our message is sort of met with some skepticism because obviously we have a dog in, in, in the fight. But for an independent lab like Modern Canada to raise some concerns, that's something that we think should resonate. Um, but before we get into the inv investigation that your team did, maybe it's best to set the table for any listeners who aren't well-versed in cannabis testing. So can you explain what the total yeast and mold testing requirements are in Florida, um, at least to start? Yeah, of course. So um, in the state of Florida, uh, the testing requirements involve testing final product and its final packaging. So flour is kind of what we're going to focus on today. It's where the problems of total yeast and mold are seen. And so with that, the limit is 100,000 CFUs per gram in the state of Florida. What's interesting is, you know, you have states that have no total yeast and mold requirements to states that have 100 CFU per gram yeast and mold requirements. So it's a pretty vast range across the U.S. And so because of that, it, it causes some issues as well on that front with data and with methodology, because if the methodology doesn't allow you to be able to meet those requirements, labs are not going to be able to produce accurate data. So. Absolutely. So with that total yeast and mold, um, basically we're looking at, you know, how much mold and yeast are in that flower. Um, it's not looking at any sort of species. It's not looking at like specifics. It's just an overall kind of big picture of what's going on in that cannabis flower. Yeah. And that's, that's an important distinction to make because, you know, you mentioned that some states, they don't have total yeast and mold testing requirements, but they do have species specific tests for things that we know are pathogenic, like, for example, aspergillus. Um, does, does Florida actually test for aspergillus as well? Yes. So we require aspergillus, all four species, um, to be tested. And then as well as that, it's salmonella and shigatoxin E. coli in flower samples. Excellent. Excellent. So I guess that's a good question then. So if you're already kind of testing for the known pathogenic species, you know, what is the benefit of a total yeast and mold test from a consumer perspective? I think really it, and that's kind of where I think the misconceptions may arise from is that consumers have been kind of, it's been portrayed to them that, okay, it's telling me, you know, is my flour moldy? But the problem with that is there's good yeasts and there's good molds. And so looking at a total count, you're sometimes going to skew those results and you're going to make a patient believe they're not safe when really they are, or a consumer, depending on if you're in a like recreational or medicinal market. Yeah. And I mean, and that's a good example with aspergillus too, right? If you were only testing for total yeast and mold, um, and you, and you had a threshold set to say a hundred thousand CFUs, you could have 99,000 CFUs of aspergillus, um, in your product. And that's, a, that's not good for anyone. Correct. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we mentioned, I mentioned in the article is like looking at those pathogenic species, because if you don't, then a product may seem safe when it actually truly isn't safe. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So now, now that we've established that, so what prompted you and the team at Modern Canner to investigate total yeast and mold? Like what, what questions were you looking to answer? So um, basically, we, similar to medicinal genomics, have had lots of questions about yeast and mold over the years. Um, as the first testing lab in the state of Florida, we originally started with plating total yeast and mold um, using like the compact dry plates and then moved into PCR testing. And we did PCR testing. Um, and then after certification, we certified through PCR for total yeast and mold. We're running samples. Um, and we actually had a client come back and say they tested with another lab and got much higher counts than what we got with PCR and they used plating. And so after that, that really triggered me to start diving in. Um, at the end of the day, the science is the most important part of it. And so figuring out that science and figuring out is there issues and how can we adapt for those issues was really my goal of doing this investigation. Um, medicinal genomics has been wonderful um, with helping do R&D and really talking us through some of the troubleshooting we've seen. Um, we 
started by, you know, doing some dilutions in PCR and kind of trying to determine if there was some suppression happening. Um, and we did see that there was in cases where if there's a ton of yeast and mold in sample, there can be suppression on the PCR. And so we started adapting the medicinal genomics method to upfront do a 20x dilution. So instead of doing one to 10 grams, like the protocol calls for, we moved to doing one gram of flour to 20 mils of TSB in order to really prevent that suppression from happening. Um, and we really saw a big difference in the reproducibility once we started doing that because we were no longer fighting, okay, is there too much yeast and mold in that sample? Right. Yeah, because in those cases, what, you would sort of be doing a, a, a rerun at, with, a, with a dilution to sort of make sure that you aren't overloading? Yeah. And so that's, that's ultimately what we ended up doing is, you know, I kind of talked to the team at Medicinal Genomics about as far as the CQ values on qPCR, what I should be seeing changes if I do dilutions. And so we started applying those dilutions. So we took a sample and we did a 2x dilution, and then we did a 5x dilution, and then we did a 10x dilution, and we watched how those CQ values should change. So we know that they should change in a very particular way and shift, you know, downfield to be a higher CQ value, lower reported value, but we weren't always seeing that if we just did the one to 10. Okay. All right. And before we leave too many people in the dust here, because, you know, this audience, I mean, I know anyone who's familiar with medicinal genomics, they're going to understand this, but, you know, this is a can med podcast. So we have some people that are more on the medical side or are more on the cultivation side. So I was hoping maybe you could briefly explain the difference between like plating and culture-based methods and PCR. Yeah, of course. So uh, with plating, basically what you're doing is you're taking your sample um, and you're diluting it in some sort of a media. Um, and then you're taking that media and you're adding that to a plate, whether that be an agar, whether that be a Petri film plate, whether that be a compact dry plate, whatever type of culture method you're using, you're going to add that diluted sample to that. Um, and there's particular amounts that you add, you know, for the agar plates, you're using only 0.1 mil, but for, you know, Petri film, you're using a full mil. So you have to factor dilutions into that as well, because that changes your result. Um, how much you plate is going to have a significant impact on what you're going to see your outcome be. So versus PCR, which, you know, is the process of taking the sample and you're extracting the DNA from that sample. And so what you're doing is you're isolating not only the cannabis DNA, but you're also isolating the microbe DNA. And then using a primer, you basically take your DNA that you've obtained and you mix it with a primer and then you load it onto the PCR and it undergoes a process of heating and cooling in order to anneal that DNA. And when those microbes are present, they bind to that primer and they anneal and then you'll fluoresce, have fluorescence and you'll see what that is. Um, the great thing about qPCR is you have an internal control, which is hex. And so that hex fluorescence lets you know that you have cannabis DNA and that your extraction worked. Um, that's a pro to PCR versus plating. With, P with plating, you have no way of knowing if it was plated correctly and if you're actually getting solution on the plate. Whereas with PCR, if you don't get that hex, you know your extraction didn't work, so you can't say for sure if that sample really has yeast or mold or not. Excellent. That was an excellent, excellent description. Um, we're not going to use that. Um, so in your investigation, if I read it correctly, you're primarily comparing plating methods to one another, correct? Correct. And we did, you know, compare kind of the PCR as well. We ran PCR on those samples, um, but mostly it was for us to do plating. Um, the state of Florida is potentially considering moving away from qPCR for total yeast and mold. And so if that happens, we wanted to be prepared since originally we were only certified for qPCR and total yeast and mold. Okay. And so there's a number of different plating methods for total yeast and mold. And it looks like based on your results that they are all, they don't necessarily agree with one another. So like, what are some of the differences here? I mean, cause I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in order for a plate to work, I mean, you're, you're putting the microbes into a solution that's supposed to be optimized for growth for a certain type of microbe. So in this case, a total yeast and mold, but as I understand it, um, it's very difficult to actually capture 
all of the yeast and mold that could potentially be there and effectively exclude any of the bacteria or other organisms that could be there. Correct. And so that's really the big battle with plating is, you know, ensuring that you're not getting bacterial growth and that you are getting only yeast and mold growth. But you also are combating the fact that aspergillus doesn't grow well on plating. So Mm. for that, if you're plating and you have aspergillus, you're still going to get lower counts than what is representative of the sample because you're not able to grow those. They don't culture well. Um, They don't survive in that type of environment, which is why qPCR is so important for some of the speciation testing, because that's the only way you're going to be able to accurately identify those compounds. Excellent. Okay. So let's get into your results here. So please talk about the number of different um, methods that you that you did and sort of what your process was and, and ultimately what you guys found. So what we did was we started um, with seven different types of plates or agars um, and used all seven of those and ran the same sample. Um, So we took a sample and we actually ran the sample in triplicate and then we ran it at three different dilutions for each plate. Um, It was a big study. My microbiologists were phenomenal. They were troopers through the entire study. Um, And it was a lot of plates um, to manage and to count and to keep track of. Um, So we did looked at compact dry. We looked at petri film, rapid yeast and mold, petri film, non-rapid yeast and mold, potato dextrose agar, potato dextrose agar with chlora tetracycline, um, dichlorin, rose, bingle, chloromethyl, <laughs> um, and fabdex. I'm not even going to attempt that one. So <laughs> those are more kind of formally known as PDA, PDAC, DRBC, and sabdex. Um, And so we took all of those plates, we plated them, we looked at, okay, what type of dilution needs to be done on the plates, Um, those agars, so the PDA, PDAC, DRBC, and SABDEX all needed to be plated at 0.1 mils versus the compact dry rapid yeast and mold and non-rapid yeast and mold petri films needed to be plated at a mil. So Mm. we mapped out what our dilutions needed to be in order to obtain the same dilution on each plate and then went about making those dilutions. Um, All of the dilutions were made for all of them at the same time, and they were all taken from the same source. And so that ensured that the homogeneity wasn't going to be in question because one of the fights you're combating with cannabis is it's not homogenous and the yeast and mold is not going to be spread evenly throughout the product. Um, You may get one scoop that, you know, has tons of yeast and mold and you may get another scoop that doesn't. And so in order to standardize that and ensure that we were getting a good, true result, we only used the sample once and then we did it for everything. Same for PCR. We also ran PCR on these. Um, What we found from the plating was it was a little shocking um, to kind of see how vastly different some of the results were and then also how different the incubation times were. So Mm. For example, rapid yeast and mold on Petri film, they recommend, you know, 48 hours. But between the 48 hour and the 72 hour mark, we saw the yeast and mold on those plates almost double. Um, So if you you have a lab that's, you know, going by the manufacturer recommendation and only incubating for 48 hours, they could be severely under quantifying yeast and mold um, in those samples. And so because of that, we established true incubation times for each of the different plates we're utilizing. Um, so that we knew kind of looking at it, how long did it need to incubate? And we did that by, we started viewing the plates at 48 hours and we view the plates at 48 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours, and 120 hours. And we looked at the change. And so the true incubation time was defined as the point in time where no new colonies appeared and instead the colonies just grew in size. And so we were able to map that out and really determine, okay, when do you need to incubate this to, to really let all of the yeast and mold grow? Interesting. And so the ultimate result that you got, like when you're comparing to um, other methods, did they all arrive at the same, you know, number or was it sort of all across the board? It it was all across the board. Um, And the other thing is even in plating, we saw a lot of suppression occurring. So your lower dilutions, you know, the standard protocol in plating is to plate at three dilutions. So, you know, you plate at a 100x, you plate at a 1000x, and you plate at a 10,000x. Um, but what we saw was if you took the average of those three results, which is kind of the standard um, for this type of methodology, 
that 100X was experiencing suppression and therefore driving the overall result down, thus skewing those results low. So when in fact a product may have failed had you factored in the 1000X and the 10,000X, when you factored in that 1000X, it drove the average down enough that the product passed. Interesting. No, and that's interesting when you were talking about sampling, and that, and that was a really good point. Um, what about subsampling from that? Because you're talking about taking like a smaller volume out of that original um, uh, sample prep, right? And putting that onto the plate. So, I mean, you could potentially be missing other microbes that don't get plated, correct? Right. And the other thing being is that, you know, if you aren't able to ensure it mixed well, how do you know that you got a good amount of, you know, whatever those microbes are versus just your media? So versus just your TSB, for example, how do you know you mixed it well? And that's where, you know, I think PCR has the benefit over plating is because yeah. you are able to ensure the process worked. And with plating, there is no internal control. Right. And the other thing too, as you pointed out in your results here, is that, you know, plating, it really relies on this growth, right? Where, you know, depending on how long you let it go, um, you're going to get a different number. Whereas with PCR, it is, I mean, it is a snapshot of what is in there at this moment. Like if you, I mean, if you kept the isolated DNA for another you know, a week or so, you wouldn't see as drastic a, a difference in results, right? Right. And so that's that's kind of the battle um, of plating versus PCR. And, you know, the other comments that people will sometimes make is, well, PCR doesn't tell you if the DNA is dead or alive. So by running PCR, you're getting everything that's present. You're not just getting the things that are alive and harmful. But the you know caveat to that and the conversation that needs to be had regarding that is that if that DNA is present, that indicates it was alive at some point. And so if you have a spurgulus, for example, that you know is now dead but was once alive, it could have created mycotoxins. Right. And then now you have a whole nother contaminant you're fighting. Um, and so that's that's a place too where I think that there needs to be more education regarding the microbes and how microbes work. Um, because I don't, I don't think that people always realize that, that like dead versus alive shouldn't matter because if it was there, it could have caused other problems. Yeah, that's a great point. And the other thing too, that, that we run into all the time is, is comparing qPCR results to plating results and, you know, how come they don't match up in certain situations, but it sounds like, I mean, looking at, at your results, plating doesn't even agree with plating. Right. And that's kind of where I think the more research needs to be done is, you know, I think everybody kind of dove into cannabis testing head first. Um, and I don't necessarily know if the knowledge and the research um, was deep enough for a head first jump. Um, the waters may have been a little too shallow. And so that may be causing a lot of these problems. And that's why, you know, my study, the purpose of this was to get people talking about total yeast and mold more. Let's get people having these conversations. Let's get people doing more research. Let's see if we can involve universities who have the time and the money and the you know, amount of lab techs that are needed to do these types of studies so we can really figure out if total yeast and mold is going to continue being a requirement in cannabis, what is the best method? And right. how do we know that's the best method? Yeah, right. Because there needs to be some sort of... <laughs> some sort of truth here, right? We're getting a whole lot of different answers. And um, yeah, we need, to, we need to figure out which one's, which one's correct and calibrate to that. Right. And, and that's really where those questions arose. During our investigation, you know, we found a standard reference material from an ISO accredited provider. And when looking at that reference material, right. we noticed that it had two drastically different results. Um, the values were 152,000 CFU per gram compared to 423,000 CFU per gram. And, you know, those are concerningly different numbers. And as we did more reading, we noticed there was a footer and that footer said that one was plated with Petri film and the other was plated with Sabdex agar. And so the question is, you know, you're looking at a result that's three times higher than the other, which, which is correct. And yeah. so you notice that labs, I think most labs probably go about using the Petri film um, 
rapid yeast and mold plates, they're really easy to work with. They're quick. Um, they tell you, you only need to incubate for 48 hours. Um, and so for labs who are trying to meet these quick turnaround times, that's going to be what they're using. Um, but if that is in fact leading to a result that's three times lower than another culture-based media, is that really a valid method? Right. No, and that and it brings up another point too, is that if you have different labs doing different methods and one's using a method that's giving lower results, then we, we get into this issue of lab shopping, correct? Correct. And so people, people, you know, it puts labs in an uncomfortable position because clients come and they're like, well, this lab obtained this result. Why aren't you obtaining this result? And then they're like, well, we're going to take our business somewhere where we can get a lower result. And I think that that's why standards in general are so important. Um, but especially with things where we're seeing such vastly different results, you know, with analytical chemistry, you know, chemistry is one thing. It's like there's a known amount of that thing and everybody should be able to obtain the same number. Mm -hmm. But microbes and microbiology is so vastly different. Um, it depends on, you know, how they incubated it. Did it get incubated at the right temperature? Did it, you know, get checked on at the right time? Did the dilution get done correctly? There's so many different factors that can change the result. And from seeing this, it seems like all kind of standard reference materials that are created for micro seem to just kind of be consensus basis. So it's run multiple times by multiple different people. And whatever the average they obtain is, is that, you know, certified value. And so because of that, you run into issues because if they're using different methods, they're getting very different results. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so we talked a, a little bit about how, how qPCR performed and how it, how it compared to some of the plating results, but I'm curious too. So you talked about how you know, even some methods when you did different dilutions or you did it in triplicate, but those results didn't um, didn't really line up. How consistent was the qPCR results when you did that, though? Because it's not having to deal with the the issue of, of growth and, and things like that. Yeah, we and, you know, <laughs> this is one of the other struggles we kind of faced and we worked with medicinal genomics quite a bit on this is we were having some lack of reproducibility there as well um, mm -hmm. with dilutions. And that's really what led us to that bigger dilution up front is because of those issues. Um, and then when you're looking at a log scale, you have to realize that when you're performing that conversion calculation from QC or CQ value to CFU per gram, you it is a logarithmic kind of formula. So that result, the larger dilution you do, is going to start to over quantify. And so that's really the big thing we saw is if you do too big of a dilution in qPCR, you're going to over quantify drastically because you're still going to get that DNA, but it's not the logarithmic scale is not going to be able to account for how large of a dilution you did. Got it. Yeah. And it, it's a great point. You talked about that, that one to 20 dilution and we did just recently published a, an updated protocol for TYM using that very same uh, dilution. So thank you for your help on that. Um, all right. So I guess kind of wrapping up here, I'm curious, what was sort of the most surprising thing you learned during this whole exercise? Um, I would say that we're not 100% sure that really yeast and mold is figured out anywhere in cannabis. Um, so we're, we're just not confident that, you know, it is a good test for cannabis material just because of the lack of homogenization in cannabis, because of the complexity of cannabis, you know, and is it really providing what consumers need to know that they're safe? Um, if you're not looking at some of these other microbes, such as powdery mildew or, you know, Fusarium species or Penicillium species, and those don't grow well on plates or those aren't identified even in qPCR, you're running into, are patients truly safe with total yeast and mold testing or do we need more pathogenic testing? Um, and after this study, I am definitely leaning on the side of, you know, we need more pathogenic testing. I think total yeast and mold testing is a great representation for, you know, the grower or the producer of how clean their process is, but I don't think it's a good indication of how safe the product is. Yeah, yeah that's, no, that's an important distinction. It's something we, I, I think we agree with you as well. Um, you know, total yeast and mold, that's it's sort of a, a big thing to take on there to, to really 
<laughs> put a stake in the ground and say, this is the total amount. I mean, that's, that's very difficult to do. Yes, there's lots of species. There's lots of species of mold and yeast. And you you just, you don't know. You can't determine if it's all growing on the plates. Um, we did some consultations with some microbiologists. Um, and one of them actually told us that in culture, even in culture-based media, you're only going to see about one fourth of what a sample truly has. And so that's kind of crazy to think about as well, because you're facing, you know, viable versus culturable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and that's a good point too, because I think I did see in your article that you mentioned testing irradiated products. Um, did you find anything interesting there? Yeah, so with irradiated products, we almost always never see qPCR hits, um, or if they are, they're very, very low. Um, with plating, we saw kind of the same thing, but there was some weird reaction that was going on, especially on the Petri film, um, and it was changing the color of the plate. So. Oh, wow the entire plate changed to a color that would indicate a yeast and mold. So on Petri film, for example, you're looking at, you know, you're looking for those blue colonies um, and the whole plate would turn blue. And it's like, okay, wait, what's, what's happening here? What's, what's going on? Um, is this a, a full plate of colonies? Is it like blown out or what's happening? Um, so we did lots of dilutions and we did see as we diluted things out, those plates turned less blue. So I do think that that radiation may have played a factor into some sort of reaction happening on those plates. Yeah, that it, it created some sort of, some sort of chemical reaction that just, you know, turned everything blue. Yeah, we're, we're really not sure. Um, I think that's another thing that needs to be further investigated. You know, there's some research that indicates that radiation just knocks down the cells versus fully destroying them. And so if that's the case, you know, if you grow these things for even longer than 120 hours, are you eventually going to start seeing growth on them? Is it is that the case? And so I, again, total yeast and mold needs a lot more research done before anyone makes any conclusive decisions about it. Excellent. All right. So I think I think you already said this, but I'll give it I'll give you another opportunity to say it. So, so based on the results of your your um, investigation here, what what would you recommend would be the best course for testing to, to make sure that patients are safe from any uh, pathogenic yeast and mold? I think number one, um, more research needs to be done. Um, more people need to participate in studies and we need to do investigations and PT providers and reference material providers, we need to work together to try to figure out how to get a good, true representative sample that could be distributed and tested by multiple different, you know, laboratories and by multiple different methods to see what kind of lines up where. Um, and then also, I personally believe that maybe moving away from total yeast and mold in cannabis is, is the right decision. And adding some additional species. I know we would be you know, happy to test things like powdery mildew and fusarium and penicillium species um, versus testing that total yeast and mold. Because, you know, in cannabis, powdery mildew is something is very, 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 very common. Um, and it's not something that grows well. And it's also something that if you run a standard total yeast and mold panel using qPCR, you're not going to identify either. Right, right. And, you know, it's a good point you make, like, is total yeast and mold a good test for cannabis? Is it used in other testing, food testing, things like that? It is, but surprisingly in food testing, um, we kind of did some looking into USP 61 versus USP 62. Um, and we did see that in food testing, it's more of along the lines of gauging how clean the process was versus gauging if the process, you know, is safe. Um, in lettuce, I can guarantee you, your lettuce probably has a lot more total yeast and mold on it than what you're seeing in your cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, because the testing that they're performing is mostly for, you know, salmonella, shigatoxin E. coli, those pathogenic species that are dangerous versus those total yeast and mold. You're, you're growing lettuce in the ground. The lettuce you grow on the ground is going to have some yeast and mold on it, especially if you're growing it in a humid environment. Right. Yeah. And one of the one of the examples we always bring up too is that, you know, sometimes you get strawberries from the grocery store and a day later you open up the fridge and they have fuzz all over them. Um, so they're not completely clean either. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And I think it that also comes down to education. Like, you know, people, whether it's been, you know, legally or not, have been using cannabis for quite some time. And 
years before testing was even a thing. Um, even out in some states that testing wasn't originally required. The rules on testing weren't developed until after a program was started up. And so in those instances, things weren't being tested. People were, you know, using product without being concerned. But now that testing's required, people are more and more concerned. But I think ultimately, you know, yeast and mold could even be visual. Like, does the bud have mold on it? If it does, don't smoke it. Um, right. Don't use that product. Um, and I think that's that's also something that where education needs to be added is like visually inspecting something and really determining, like you said, if your strawberries that you open from your fridge have fuzz on them, you're you're not going to eat them. Um, so the same kind of goes with your cannabis products. Right. A little common sense goes a long way. All right. So winding down here, Jenny, I did want to give you an opportunity um, before I let you go to plug any website, social media, or any additional resources that you think would be helpful for the listeners to, to learn more about what we talked about today. Yeah, I think, you know, Analytical Cannabis is a great resource. Uh, they're a provider who does a lot of publications on cannabis testing, um, as well as our website, moderncanna.com. Um, we've got lots of information as well, kind of on different blogs on testing and things like that. Um, and to also be on the lookout for more presentations from our lab. Um, we're doing a lot more research and development now, um, and we're going to be participating in a lot more uh, kind of presentations and conferences that are mostly focused on standardization in general. So not just yeast and mold, but across the industry. All right. Excellent. We'll be on the lookout for that. We'll have to have you back on uh, to talk about something else. And hopefully we'll see you out at CanMed as well. <laughs> yes, that would be great. All right. Thanks again, Jeannie. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jenny Curry. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, Modern Canna Labs. Our next episode will drop August 3rd. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, sign up for email alerts, follow us on social media, and subscribe to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast so you can be among the first to know all the details around our CanMed 23 event. All right, and that's it from us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and please come back for the next episode of CanMed Coffee Talk.